Patricia Ticinetto Clo introduces the effective turn as a significant shift in critical theory, arising from profound changes in the economic, political, and cultural spheres during the 1990s. This shift encompasses a new configuration of bodies, technology, and matter, prompting a re-evaluation of fundamental metaphors of life. Claude defines effect as potential bodily responses, distinct from emotion, transcending consciousness and influencing bodily capacities to affect and be affected. Karen Wendy Gilbert's chapter challenges the established laws of thermodynamics, attributing them to the 19th century and industrial capitalism. She questions the prevailing belief in matter and energy's tendency towards equilibrium within closed systems. This re-evaluation extends the concept of subjectivity from a unified and enclosed organism model, to one centered on effect, as energy flows between porous bodies in open systems or networks. Elizabeth Wissinger's exploration of effective labor in the modeling industry illuminates the dynamic interaction between models, information, and televisual technologies. This interaction makes the body and image available for circulation, feeding the constant demand for images, and participating in an effect economy. This perspective aligns with Sarah Ahmed's concept of the effects of body and world boundaries. Greg Goldberg and Craig Wills re-examine trauma theories, challenging the notion of a thermodynamic self in psychoanalysis. They propose a new understanding of the injured soldier as a constellation of capacities that undergo transformation through rehabilitation. This process is now viewed as a biopolitical form of control, perpetually calculating, engineering, and mutating life itself. A subset of chapters delves into the intersection of theory, body, effect, and capital. David Staple's chapter traces the evolution of capitalism from a thermodynamic model to a turbulent system driven by female labor flows. He reconsiders the notion of the gift in terms of the giving of time and information. Ariel Ducey's chapter on healthcare workers provides concrete examples of how training and certification programs shape the experience of work refashioning it as a source of stimulation and engagement. This adjustment occurs through the body, influencing which emotions or attitudes can even be expressed. The book is acutely aware of the necessity for employing innovative writing approaches slash methods to apprehend the material and temporal dimensions of bodies, for it incorporates experimental and autoethnographic writing styles, most notably evident in the chapters authored by Hosu Kim, Deborah Gams, Grace M. Cho, Jonathan Wynne, and Jean Halley. The overall impact of these diverse genre and mode techniques is somewhat mixed, and to this reader, occasionally executed with unevenness. Some, like Kim's The Parched Tongue, engage in intriguing multilingual work in a prose poem-like form, defamiliarizing both English and Korean. However, at times, Kim's approach veers towards the prosaic and familiar. Gams endeavors to illustrate a specific process of writing, kinetic energy, and cellular awareness, primarily through an excessive use of verbs and adverbs. This inadvertently emphasizes the challenge of animating or representing physical and conceptual dynamics in fresh ways. Nevertheless, Cho's voices from the tomb and winds haunting Orpheus are more engaging and successful in demonstrating the imperative of pushing linguistic and generic boundaries to grasp the complexities of new ways of understanding life what wind terms, ethnographic heteroglossia.
However, experimentation with writing need not be confined to these overt forms. For instance, one can discern the interplay of language in both the performative style of close introduction and Bianco's techno cinema. Here, there are passages brimming with linguistic vitality, perhaps intended to express a yearning for vitality and turbulence, by surpassing or resisting the gravitational pull towards the status quo, wrestling for meaning that undermines meaning, and reaching for language that is yet to be born. Such passages argue that the poetics and rhetoric accompanying significant shifts in thought may indeed need to challenge readerly expectations. Yet, the outcome is occasionally a vexing surplus of linguistic and communicative abundance, evoking thoughts of critiques directed at theory talk, and its alienating and exclusive rhetoric. As Chris Holcomb has contended, such flights of language aren't necessarily radical ruptures from the fundamental structures of language and communication, but can instead be perceived as a default reliance on well-trodden techniques of obfuscation and generalization.